Uh, okay, nice one. I'll start reading the antitrust policy of the Linux Foundation. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors and it's the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that attendees adhere to missing agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in Linux Foundation antitrust policy. If you have questions about these matters, please contact your company council or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew Up the Grove of the firm of Gasmir Up the Grove, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. Hyperledger is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our Hyperledger Code of Conduct. So welcome everybody. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Enigio, uh, namely in the person of Gunnar Colin and Lars uh, Hansen. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's like going back to the roots today because they are both Swedish and I've been working for a Swedish company for a long time. So it's my pleasure to, to leave space for them to, to introduce their solution and to, to, to see an interaction with DLTs and Hyperledger solutions. Gunnar, would you like to start first or launch? No, so you. let's get, yeah. Hi, everyone. So really, really happy to be here. Thank you, Andrea. We, we, are, we are chuffed that, that we were invited to this session. Uh, so really happy about that. Uh, before I dig into the, to the meat and potato here, uh, maybe we should do a quick update on who we are. And maybe you would like to start, Lars. Is that OK? OK. Yeah. Um, you were not prepared for this. Sorry about this, Lars, but I think it, it, it would be good. Yes, so people know you when we have questions and answers a little bit later. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. Um, Gunnar and I were recovering bankers, as we like to say. Um, and um, I have a, a, a long banking, banking uh, background and, and approaching retirement, to be quite honest. Um, but I'm go not going to retire because this is too much fun. Um, so. Um, I did electronic banking in the 80s, and to be quite honest, uh, functionally, not a lot of things have happened. We could actually do things that we are doing today on the internet um, with large corporates. The services were there in the 80s. The only area today and then that was not uh, digitized was negotiable instruments and documents of title. And uh, this is a pain point that I experienced when I was uh, deputy head of, of risk on group level in SAB. So I ended up doing cash management and, and ended my career in banking, being one of those corporate guys who uh, provided the biggest lie in history. I'm here for, I'm, hello, I'm from headquarters. I'm here to help you. Uh, not always true, uh, according to the business. So, um, and, and Gon, Gon and I were old co colleagues. Um, so um, I, um, I, uh, what I, my contribution is this is was really to specify the requirements for a negotiable instrument or a document or title in a digital environment. That's my background. Thank you, Lars. And yes, so so Lars and I, we 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 we've been working together previously, and and it's really good to be uh, to be working for Enigio now. Uh, I, I, I would like to run through through a few slides so we all understand what's going on here. And, and once I've done that, I think we should have an open discussion and, and questions and answers uh, because I think uh, that might be the case. Uh, so just building a little bit on what, what Lars said. So uh, we at Enigio, we are not only sort of recovering bankers, we, we have sort of tech guys and, and maybe more importantly, uh, sort of people who are really engaged and, and who are really, really deep in archiving and, and especially uh, digital archiving. Uh, 
when I first came across these guys, uh, I thought that they were really, really pointy heads and they were really focusing on things that might not be that important, but I have actually changed my mind. Uh, it's really, really important, especially these days when, when, when you work with sort of digital data that you know what you're doing and, and making sure that you can keep sort of your data safe and you, you will be able sort of to, to manage it and, and, and store it and retrieve it in, 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 in a really good way. And this sort of competence around this and also very, uh, very much knowledge around, around tech and cryptography and, and then later on combined with sort of knowledge about how a bank works has actually made this company come alive and and this is this is the reason uh, why we have this very very particular solution that i will get back to in in a minute um showing slides you should all also uh, sort of emphasize so the the the, the current problem uh, and obviously, we all know this because we are all into trade finance, that there are so many things that needs to be fixed. There are too many paper documents flying around the, the globe. Uh, there, it's very, very cumbersome with today's processes to, to interact and, and to exchange data. And if that wasn't sort of enough, uh, there is also a lot of, of fraud and... and sort of suspicious activities and, and, and uh, money laundering activities going on that you need sort of to, to be able to manage and, and, and um, uh, cope with. And, and all of this has obviously all come together during these horrible COVID-19 times. Uh, so, so a lot of things we need to fix and, and, and a lot of initiatives going on out there. But as, as Andrea said, maybe, maybe it's time to go back a little bit to, to basics. And, and this is, this is what, what I would like to do. And as I mentioned, we are, uh, we are into archiving, we're into tech, we're into banking. And if you think about it, a paper document is a really good standard. And I think this has been somewhat forgotten uh, because these days, everyone is, is trying desperately to scrape off anything that is written on a document and put that data into a computer system or a blockchain and then have everyone sort of going on to the same system and, and starting sort of interchanging that data between themselves. And it seems like we all forgotten uh, that sort of the, the sheet of paper actually represent something in itself and and this is this is really the core of what we're doing at the need we, we are we don't really care about what people are sort of having what, what kind of information or data they, they're dealing with we are more concerned with how do you actually replicate the awesome standard of the paper sheet into the digital world uh, because as I, as, I, as I mentioned, people seem to have forgotten about, about the fact that, that, that the paper actually represents a, a very, in, very important things. And this is, this is what we are all about. We're all about sort of uh, creating things that behave and act exactly the same way as a, as a paper does in, in the physical world and replicating that into the digital world. That is not trivial though, uh, because you have to be very careful and, and, and there are solutions out there, but from what we have seen, sort of a scanned image is not good enough. It's not a good way of digitizing sort of a paper document. There are really good PDF solutions or a PDF solutions out there. You can make them really safe and secure, but, but there are a few things that you actually cannot do with a PDF. And these are the things that we have uh, worked on. And these are the things that we have actually solved. So, so there are, in my mind, seven key 
functions of our solution uh, that sort of sets us apart to uh, everything else that that is available and and that is out there so so the first thing is is really being able to distinguish the original from from a copy and as Lars mentioned this might not not be very important in in many cases uh, but but in some cases it's crucial and especially in trade finance when 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 you deal with uh, bills of exchange promissory notes uh, warehouse receipts or or even bills of lading then you need to know uh, if you are in possession of the original or if you only have a copy and that copy might be very secure and uh, very safe but if you can have a zillion of them, they are not very valuable for, for creating bills of exchange, for instance. So, so this is the first thing that we set out to solve. Uh, the second thing is, is all around possession. And, and I usually say this, that you all, you all have a lot of papers uh, lying around and you know that you own those pieces of paper and you know what's written on them. And this is also very important in the digital world that you know that you are in control of the, over the original and that you are in control over the content that is actually written in the, this original. So it's not stored somewhere else. So it's stored actually in the document and, and that you can own it. And you know that you are in possession of it and, and no one else. Uh, furthermore, transferability is also really key. So having sort of created a digital original, it's not much worth if you cannot sort of transfer that original from one person or one entity to another one. So you need to be able uh, to transfer the, the one original uh, to a new party. And once you've done that, this new party needs to be able to continue to manage and work with the document and write whatever they want on it or add a signature or add an appendix or anything. Uh, so, so this is really key. So the document cannot be stale. It needs to be dynamic, but it, it needs to be sort of open for new content only uh, for the one that is actually in possession of the, of the one original. I think also it's important uh, to mention that, that our solution was really created in order to comply with current laws and, and, and legislation, uh, provided that they are technology neutral. And therefore, you also need to be able uh, to stand in front of a court of law and be able to say that I'm in possession of the one original, and you need to be able to prove that. Uh, so the document also needs not only to be uh, distinguish the original from the copy, be able to prove that you're in possession of the one original, transfer it to a new party, but you also need to be able to present this and prove that this is the case. Uh, so these are four key um, features of our solution. And if you think about it, um, once again, these are actually, to a very large extent, what sort of the paper sheet represents in the, in the physical world. Uh, so this is what we replicated digitally. But, but you get a few other good things uh, with this. Uh, first of all, you will get sort of a, a digital document that is immutable, uh, because now we'll get back to the, to the DLT technology that we use. It makes them immutable. Uh, you will also have the full traceability and the full audit trail of what has happened to this document in the document. So it will not sit anywhere else. It will be in the document. So anyone who comes in possession of the latest original will be able to see what has, has happened to it uh, previously. And as I mentioned, since we, we are just focusing on recreating the sheet of paper, so whatever data you put into our documents, it stays in the document. So it's not leaked anywhere else, sort of the business data and and uh, if you use personal data will be in the document. Uh, so you will not have any data privacy issues uh, because it will, you will not share the data anywhere else. 
And also, if you look at this from, from a, a GDPR perspective, if you, if you happen to deal with personal data <coughs> and someone wants to be forgotten, uh, you can actually delete the document exactly the same way as you do with a physical one. Uh, just to summarize a little bit, so we create digital documents and we store the data in the documents. So nothing is stored on the blockchain, uh, but we have a blockchain. The only thing we use sort of the blockchain for is actually to store the evidence of the existence of the document. So if you go on to our, our website and you look at our blockchain, you will only see sort of the hashes. Uh, nothing else, so you cannot extract or detract any any business data uh, from the blockchain, and and we wouldn't know anything anything about uh, uh, about sort of the the business content or uh, whatever you you written in your document. <clears throat> so, how do we actually do this? So, uh, first of all, just quickly, you know, a physical document. As I said, we have replicated. Uh, because we think it's a really good standard, the paper. Uh, so in the physical world, you have a piece of paper uh, and then you write something on the piece of paper. Then you know what's written on the piece of paper and you know what's not written on it. And in order for, for a, a physical document to have some kind of va value, it needs to contain a promise and someone has to sign this promise with wet ink. Uh, so this is, this is how you create... Uh, uh, paper documents in the physical world. We all know this. What we often tend to forget is that once you press print and you create a paper original, you created a little cost monster and you have to babysit this cost mon monster throughout its lifetime. So it's very costly and cumbersome and time consuming to deal with paper documents uh, because you have to store them, you have to manage them, you have to retrieve them, you have to do a lot of things with them, especially if, if there are documents of value. What is really, really bad these days, I would say, is that when, when banks and companies think that they are going digital, they scan the documents. But really what happens is that they create two versions of the same thing. Uh, so then you, you suddenly have, you have two documents uh, you will not know if the data is, is matched between them two and you have dual processes and you actually have, have uh, dual costs as well for, for managing this whole thing. So we think this is, this is really, really bonkers and I think you agree with it. So what we do is that instead of paper, if you... If you come to us and, and you want to issue or create a digital original document, we, we work with a, with a normal data file and we just add content to the file. Then in order to replicate sort of what the paper sheet borders represent physically, we use the, the, uh, the we hash the content and thereby we, it's, it's sort of uh, closed and it's contained within the document. And then we publish the hashes on our blockchain. Uh, so this is this is what we're using the blockchain for, only as a notary service for all of these documents. As I mentioned in the physical world, if if a paper document is going to have some kind of value, someone has to sign it with wet ink. Uh, so what we do is that we actually add uh, an electronic signature to our document. So it can be any type of electronic signature. We can accept anything. Uh, we just add it to the document and then we hash it again. And there, therefore we have a, a document that is readable by man and mach machine uh, with an actual um, electronic signature incorporated into the document. The way we make sure that you can actually prove possession and you can actually prove uh, that you're in, in control of, of the one original we also work with cryptographic key pairs. So once a document is created, a public key and a private key is issued and the public key goes into the document and is also published on the blockchain. So this means that the only one that can actually do something with the document is the one that is, is in possession of the private key that corresponds to the public key. This also means that you can transfer possession 
so if I want to transfer an original document from, from me to Andrea, for instance, the only thing Andrea needs to do is to create a cryptographic key pair and he, he can share the public key with me. So when I write the public key in the document and that gets published on the blockchain, I lose control over the original. Now Andrea has to control because he is in possession of the private key that corresponds to the public key that's published on the blockchain and is written in the document. So in order for him to start to continue sort of managing and dealing with the document, I have to send him the actual uh, latest version of the document. All of this also means that we are not sort of dealing with tokens or anything like that. So we're dealing with, we're actually creating documents that are sort of the actual asset. And it also means that you can sort of use our documents and you can share them and, and send them and, and do whatever you want with them. Uh, so you can do everything that you do today, but you can do it digitally. And the only thing uh, we use the blockchain for, as I mentioned, is, is we use it as a, as a notary service. Our solution is also free in the sense that the only one that sort of needs to have anything to do with us is actually the one who wants to create uh, an original. And it's the same thing as if you want to create a paper document, you need to buy a piece of paper. You really need a piece of paper, otherwise it's hard. So the one who wants to create a digital original document with our technology, they have to come to us to buy the digital paper. But once they've done that, they can, they can write anything on it and they can send it to anyone. And, and any new holder or receiver can, can receive the document and can send it on to yet another new owner without having to pay anything or do anything uh, apart from they need to have a, a computer and they need access to the internet. And every time they need, they want to do operations uh, to the document, they need to make, make sure that the blockchain is updated or the notary service is updated to, to evidence whatever has happened to that particular document. Uh, so when we compare ourselves with other solutions, as I mentioned, and we compare ourselves from, from a control of ownership point of view, and security and integrity point of view, uh, we, we, we outperform everyone else uh, because we are, uh, we, we, our documents are really safe, they're really secure and you can 100% prove ownership. Uh, that's not necessarily the case for paper original documents. Uh, and as I mentioned, you can make really, really good PDFs, uh, really safe and secure but it's very hard to distinguish an original from a copy. And scanned uh, paper originals, we shouldn't talk about them because uh, we shouldn't be using them at all. I should also say in this context that you can actually create our uh, original documents as PDFs if you, if you want to, and that makes them sort of very easy to handle and, and easy to understand and easy to read and everything else. Okay, so as Andrea said, back to the basic, a document, it's a really, really good standard and it's a good basic standard uh, for, for starting. Uh, so how can this be used? Uh, this, is, this is a very, very busy slide. I know this, uh, but uh, I really like it a lot because it, it really calls out sort of what you can do with the, with the digital document that is sort of constructed in the way we, we, we've done it. Uh, on, the, on the upper hand of this slide, uh, we have sort of a very schematic schema overview of how trade finance works today. And, and, and the key thing in the gray area, and the key thing is that sort of there are, there are very, very many uh, players and, and parties involved in a trade transaction. You have the importer and the exporter, the banks, the freight forwarders, the, the shippers, the customers, and everything, uh, everyone else. And all of them 
are using their own sort of software, uh, their ERP system or back office or platforms or portals or anything. So every one of them are sort of handling and managing the digital data within their own software systems. And, and when they want to communicate with other parties in the transaction, sort of the common denominator and the common standard is actually the physical document. So when they want to, to sort of exchange data and, and do things, they use physical documents. And in some parts, they can actually exchange data between themselves. But if you, if you look at the, the overall uh, participant in, in trade, it's still sort of the paper document that, that is used. And for good reasons, because it's a good standard. Everyone knows what it is. Everyone can recognize it and everything else. So if we move down sort of the, 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 the common approach these days is really to try to have everyone going on to the same platform to start interchanging data. And you know, there are a lot of initiatives, initiatives ongoing, especially in the blockchain space that are trying to build platforms where all the parties can exchange data on the platforms to, to make sort of this whole process seamless and, and efficient. And we're not saying that that, that's, that is a bad idea. It's a really good idea, but it's very, very hard uh, to make it work because you, you need to onboard everyone uh, and you need to deal with all the data privacy and access, con access control issues because someone has to manage all of this. It's very lengthy. Um, it's very uh, often very costly and you need to transform, you need to change your current processes and, and the way you done, you're doing things. And you need to be able sort of to share your data. So what we are saying is that we're not into that space. So, but what we are saying is that why not look at the documents and make the documents really digital and really safe and really secure, uh, because then you will not have uh, sort of onboarding at all because everyone can sort of receive them and store them. Uh, you don't need to change your processes. You don't, don't need to change your back office systems. You don't need to do anything except for sort of digitizing or accepting a digital document instead of uh, today, a paper document. And if we move into the bank space, obviously uh, this, is, this is really, really convenient uh, because now you can perform uh, sort of collections or uh, documents under a letter of credit and, and you can do them fully digital uh, the whole sets, and you can send them and interchange them uh, with the current um, sort of methods that you use. Basically, sort of you can send them and receive them uh, through Swift. So there is no there is no issue with that. Sort of everything is already in place. You have the file act. It's just to attach a document and exchange the the keys, and 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 then you can actually exchange the, the, the real documents, the original documents, and no need for uh, dealing with copies or sort of having DHL or FedEx to, to, to send the, uh, the original documents uh, uh, as a parallel process. You can, you can discontinue that uh, altogether. Uh, also a few words, just, just getting back. So uh, I, I won't sort of demo the whole system now because it, it will, but uh, it's, it's not that complicated. And as I said, uh, sort of the, the generic process is really that someone creates the document, someone signs it, and then it's getting sort of sold or handed off uh, to a new party. Uh, so the, what this sort of picture represents are sort of the generic steps. So first of all, someone has uh, to create the document. It's not very complicated. Then someone has to sign it. And then once that is done, uh, the sort of the creator and the owner can, can choose to, to own the document throughout its lifetime. 
but if they wish or if they sort of on sell it it can it can be sold to a new owner and then uh, managed uh, throughout its lifetime uh, also uh, I should say that we are working very, very closely with International Trade and Forfeiting Association. And if you are really curious on how to use our digital documents in, in a real case, uh, I suggest that you uh, study how you can, you can use trace original documents for creating and managing uh, digital negotiable instruments. And, and ITFA, they've been very uh, sort of thorough in this work, so so they have also issued a manual around how, how you can do this. <clears throat> uh, so just to summarize and do sort of a little bit of sales pitch, uh, we think that our, our trace original documents are really good because it's very it, it's easy to increase revenues because uh, you can you can actually introduce a new way of of going digital. Uh, more importantly so, it's, it's really, really good for efficiencies because you won't have sort of the dual and scan paper process. Uh, you can get rid of that and you can have uh, one process. Needless to say, turnaround times will be uh, much quicker and easier because, as I said, the documents are created digitally, they are signed digitally and they are transferred and managed uh, digitally. They are, as, as you probably all figured out, they are 100% machine readable. So it, they can be machine readable with any type of, of AI you have out there, uh, much better than just doing OCR. And obviously you will have very, very short lead times and everything else. Uh, when we talk about risks, since you have very, very little implementation risk because you're not sort of onboarding something completely new, you are just, instead of pressing print on paper, you just decide to print them digitally. You have, so you have very, very low implementa implementation risk. Also, they, the documents in themselves, they are completely fraud safe because if someone tries to manipulate them or change them, it will be de detected by, by the hashes immediately. Uh, no double uh, data management, as I said, uh, which is really, really a good way of lowering your operational risk. I would assume that there are a lot of banks out there these days that have a huge problem with dual data. One data set sitting on physical documents and the other uh, being sitting on scanned copies and, and OCR, then maybe you don't capture everything. So it's the very good of reducing operational risk. Uh, also, if, if you're a bank, obviously everything, every single uh, line, every single uh, digit is, is actually uh, available for compliance scans. So, so you won't have any mismatch in that. Uh, and the cost then, of course, uh, you have if you want to use our technology, sort of the one creating the original has to pay us a small fee to get the, the, do, the, the, the digital document. But otherwise, there is, uh, you, you can sort of get rid of your uh, courier cost, your archiving cost, your scanning and your handling of paper originals. You can get uh, rid of all of that. Yeah, so... Uh, I think I stop there and open up for, for questions and discussions. Do you want to add anything, Lars? I think you pretty much said it all, didn't you? <laughs> well, I tried to. I think it was a good one. Thank you, Gunnar. It was really interesting. I mean, it was a confirmation of what we have discussed, you know, earlier on the former weeks. So I'll leave it on to the attendants to ask some questions. I see some, somebody who could be interested in making questions. Yeah, hi, Guna. This is uh, Tat Yin from Singapore. And let me start by asking, can just about anyone receive uh, the document? Uh, and uh, if know uh, what might uh, 
a potential recipient need to do in order to be able to receive such a document? Do you want to, do you want to answer that one, Lars? Yes. Um, the document has a header page, uh, which explains what you are, because in most countries where you, will, if you want to transact electronically, you have to accept this. Um, and um, what you are, you are, um, and what you do is you go to traceregional.com, which is uh, a web page. Uh, and, and on the web page, you can start by verifying that the the copy that you obviously want to review before you buy it is authenticate, uh, uh, authentic, and you can verify that. Let's say that you want to buy this the, the security. What you do is that you you go to uh, the next um, phase where you manage the document and you and you create. A, a cryptographic key pair, and you send the cryptographic key pair to the to the um, seller of the document, um, and uh, and the seller will will insert the public key, just like Gunnar said, uh, and will and and he will send you the document, and at that point you are, are in full control of it, and and on the manage. Uh, functioning in, in on the web, web page, you make you can make additions. You can um, invite someone to sign the document if you want to amend something. Basically, you can add to any type of text to the document. So it's, it is like paper, uh, but it's digital. I see. So, um, so that means that. Uh, a potential recipient of the document uh, needs to like subscribe to the service no the uh, the, um, the the blockchain is a semi public uh, which means that the only ones who have to subscribe are those who are creating documents but once it's created it's freely transferable and in in in, in, in trade Honestly, you, you actually, if you trade documents, oil or, or, or commodities or anything else, you, you don't know who is going to be exposed to the document and, and who might want to own it. Uh, does a bank want to have the document as collateral, uh, etc.? So the, the notion of having a freely transferable document is really, it's been a driving force uh, for us. Um, and we don't have a contract with those out there. We only have a contract with those who buy, buy digital paper from us. Um, so making for a banker liquidity is, that's poor. So to in, increase as much liquidity in, in the asset as possible, if it's a prom note or a, a, a bill of exchange, um, is really core. So that's why the you don't need to have a subscription to handle a created document, but you have to have a subscription to create the document. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a bit challenging for me to visualize uh, how a recipient of the document would actually, uh, you know, receive that document and interact uh, with it. Uh, so, so perhaps you know now or in a you know, follow-up session, it'd be nice uh, if there could be a demo of, of uh, the recipient's actions uh, uh, to, to be able to receive a document. Um, Gunnar, you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so yes, uh, I, I just want to talk a little bit because this is really, really key. I'm, I'm really happy about this question. So two things. Uh, the only thing you need is you need a computer and you need access to the internet. Those are the only two things you actually need uh, in order to be able to receive a trace original document. Obviously, you also need uh, to know what you are receiving, right? Uh, and, and, and first of all, we, as I mentioned, you can create a trace regional document as a PDF, right? But you need to be aware that this is a special PDF where you need sort of the, the private key in order 
and the right version of, of the original in order to be able to write on it. Uh, but apart from that, sort of, if, if I'm if I a new receiver of a document, first of all, I need to make sure that I have uh, sort of the private key that corresponds to the document. But otherwise, I will just re receive an email with a PDF attachment, and that's it. This is the only thing I need to do. So it's not more complicated than that. But once I sort of receive the document, I need to be aware that I have actually received maybe a bill of exchange. And if you receive a bill of exchange through DHL, you know that you are receiving a physical and you need to, to know what to do with it. And the same thing goes for, for, for these documents. So if you receive a trace original as a, a bill of exchange, you need to know that this is a, bill, an, a digital bill of exchange and I need to take as much care of it as I do with the physical one or if it's a bill of lading or, or something else. So, so from a mindset point of view, uh, you need to be careful and you need sort of to manage it properly the same way as you manage a, a paper document. Because these are documents of value usually with value, yes. So same thing as paper, yeah. Uh, Andrea, you have to manage us, uh, but, but while you are doing that, I would just like to add one other thing. Uh, yes. I, I enjoyed the previous session you had with... Uh, sorry, say it again, uh, Gunnar. No, so I just wanted to add, because I, I, I really enjoyed the previous session we had, you had with BAFT on the digital ledger payment commitment. Yeah. We had it on the 10th of February, yes. Yeah, so that's a good one. Yeah, and, and we love BAF too much. And we think they've done sort of a tremendous job in crafting how to set up these uh, payment commitments on, uh, on absolutely. the block. Absolutely, absolutely, Gunnar. You're perfectly right. They've done an awesome job, actually. And uh, potentially, awesome. they have created something that could. I mean, not replace as a whole. That could act as a sort of. Sorry, if it's me. Because. Oh, so what I wanted to say is that we also worked with BAFT, and we're going to issue a white paper now, where we uh, say that not only can you use these 13 data points and manage them on a blockchain, you can also put them into a trace original document. That, that's nice. I mean, yes. it is. it's good to hear that. I mean, it's yes. just but a step forward. I mean, I was always telling me it's, it's a good one. It's a nice achievement. I look for the white paper, of course, to read it carefully. Um, it's a good one. We're in contact. We will hopefully uh, we'll we'll be back, you know, you know, gonna uh, with some more news from Bath uh, shortly after after this meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, there's quite a lot to be done on that side of the world as well, you know, because Bath is deeply steeped into the Americas. So we will be back, I think, uh, with, with the people of Bath uh, yeah. soon. Uh, thanks for all for for these notes. Uh, um, I would love to ask if there is anybody else who would like to make questions to Gunnar and to Lars as well. It's a good chance to, to, to go deeper into this, you know. Uh, yeah, guys, uh, just a question from me. So hi, hey, Gunnar, hey, Lars. Hey, mate, how are you? Hi. Fine, well, thank you. Good, good. Uh, thank you for sharing. Um, question from my side was, in the event of a dispute... Uh, where these documents are used in the transaction. Um, what's the thought of the country where the dispute happens and their recognition of digital contracts versus paper? Has, how does that feature in some of your uh, travels? Should I? Yes, of course you should. Um, the... There's a lot happening right now um, in, in, in digital legislation. Uh, in, within 
the EU, uh, we have something called ADAS, the Regulation for uh, Digital uh, Identity and, and Trust Services, uh, which states that, um, basically states technology neutrality within the EU. Um, so within EU, um, we have a, a, a reasonably, um, it, the legislatures are pointing towards digitization as long as you uh, cater for the safety mecha mechanisms of a physical document. So if we can replicate all the face safe safety mechanisms that are surrounded uh, on a bill of uh, negotiable or a document or title, it should be a, a legally valid document, specifically if you use qualified signatures. Um, Latin America, most a lot of uh, Latin American countries have uh, had the European legislation as a, a um, inspiration, and, and they are looking very much the same um, as the European legislation. Um, Singapore, um, for instance, having common law uh, has been in the forefront and is about to change um, the, uh, the, the legislation so that it, it doesn't have to be tangible, that uh, digital negotiables and, and um, documents of title will be allowed. The same process is going on in, in the UK uh, and with the Law Commission. So this is happening. If you, if you look on New York and Illinois in the United States, uh, their signature uh, or electronic transaction acts, uh, they actually open up for digital negotiables. Um, so um, this is happening right now. Uh, and a lot of country, com countries are um, working on getting um, a technology neutral legislation around um, digital, ass digital assets. Great, thank you. Um, Gunnar, Lars, it's Eugenio here. Um, I, I just want to share um, a suggestion and, uh, um, and I ask you at the same time a clarification, okay? Um, uh, first of all, I, I, I really love the Nijo solution. It really like Andrea said, get, getting back to the basics to understand that we really need a flexible solution to, to, to support uh, the digitalization of the industry overall uh, from the bigger player to the smaller ones. Uh, I, I actually asking you, um, I mean, at least from my perspective and my understanding, okay, um, I'm trying to uh, picture in the process of a role of uh, uh, the original creation. Um, I understand that uh, the main um, process is related to the creation of this original document. And in the act of transferring uh, this document, a DLT based service is uh, applying as a, a notarization services. Okay, for, for the transfer. Um, I just want to share my vision. I mean, uh, you, Gunnar, said that um, you are not dealing with tokens. In, in my perspective, I think that when you use a DLT based service to notarize and you, to create a unique value by hash uh, encryption, and you want that is going to be uh, defined as a unique value, uh, you're managing a digital asset that basically entitles you to transfer rights. So from a regulatory perspective, I think that this can be defined as a utility token. If you, in the act of transferring, okay? But I mean, this is just my suggestion that I want, I want to share it. But to, to be frank, I mean, what, what you do to identify you as the current holder is that you have, you, you present the original, the, the latest copy of the original or the original and the corresponding key. Um, you can do, you, you can verify that without 
the ledger um, if you want to. Uh, that's not necessary. The only thing is that you you will not be sure that you actually have the latest version of, of, of the document, because if someone would have an older cryptographic key and, and um, an older version, um, they would that would actually apply for um, um, or it would ver verify that without the document or well without the ledger as a, a, a valid copy of that version. So what, why the, the ledger is so important is that we keep, we keep, keep track of the latest version of the document, the latest version of the original. Uh, that's, the, that, that's the main function of the, of the, the blockchain. But in order to be able to write on the blockchain, you actually need to, the credentials, the correct document and the correct key. Sure, sure, sure. So, so but it, 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 at the end of the day, we, I, I think that we sometimes get end, end up in semantics rather than in, in, in functionality. <laughs> no, no, it, I understand. I think you're right. It's just my suggestion. I mean, from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, consumer, I mean, uh, for client perspective, uh, I think that this is uh, quite more similar a tokenization process of a digitized document once uh, the original is transferred uh, by a DLT notary service. Uh, it's just my, but just my my my, my vision. And but well, you, you you have to take care. I mean, uh, it's a very thin line in my opinion. Um, it's just a matter of proving the originality of the documents. Maybe you missed a little point you know, in, the, in the loop of documentary collection. Uh, what Gunnar and Lars were saying, you know, they were referring to documents of titles and negotiable documents. Uh, we don't have that space here in the meeting to, to go deeper into this, but it's, uh, you know, there are three finance specialists in the meeting today that could detail how this works, you know, when you have to deal with documentary collections. Uh, there's, a, there's a good distinction between documents of title and negotiable instruments. Um, it is, and sometimes I also think about this, you know, are they tokens or not? But in my vision, an EGO focuses more on the side of proving the originality of the documents the rather change in a digital environment rather than creating tokens to be exchanged on on a DLT. I think that what we have been focusing on is recreating the safety mechanisms. Yeah, what goes on in the physical space, Lars, and to enhance maybe keeping the same level of security and safeness. And, and, and I believe that if we want to digitize trade and, and, and finance and, and other transactions uh, that are very, of, of great value, we need to comply with current legislation. It, it will take years and years and years if we're gonna if every type of, 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 of um, legislation should kind of be adopted to technology i think it's a smoother path to adopt technology to legislation yeah i agree with you Lars. absolutely the problem is and especially in trade is the legislation is not homogeneous you know you mentioned the singapore has its own way to go South America is following the theme of the of European legislation. So to deal with trade, of course, being on a global scale is somehow a little messy and it could take time as well. Although we take this approach. Yeah. But um, a couple of years ago, 20 years ago, you could not use a European uh, mobile phone yeah. in the Americas. Now you can. Now you can. And, and, and what we, what we I, I think what we need to realize is that we cannot change the world trying to monopolize things. What we need no. to do, we have to have, we need to coll collaborate, we need to be open, uh, we need to accept that, that some utilities that are presented and, and solutions are fantastic on some things, and, and, and our technology is good on, on one thing. 
and that's recreating the document. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 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 but I, I mean, I, I, that was my first statement. I, and saying, saying, okay, the, I really like the technology and I understand the value uh, in, into the core, okay? That is a, having a software flexible, in a flexible way that can work on a different um, uh, business solution that are in the market and digitized in a, a flexible and harmonizing way. Um, I, I wanted just to share my, my vision into the process overall and see that maybe, according to my understanding from regulatory perspective, when there is a transfer uh, and a digital asset in, uh, there's, there's, I think, a utility token that is coming. Yes, go ahead. We like your vision, Eugenio. Just, just wanted to let you know. Can I just, can I just answer a question that came on the on the chat from Bob? Yeah, yeah. I was just about to mention this, but you, you can go. On. No worries. Yes, because I think it's a good question. Yeah. Uh, and 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 just to take a step back. So, our business model is is based on the fact that the only one that has to deal sort of directly with us from a customer perspective is the one who wants to create the original document. So they need to buy, if you wish, the, the, the digital paper from us. We don't see, we don't care, we don't have anything to do sort of with the content. Uh, but but if, if I want to create the digital original, I go to Tracer, I go to Enigio and I sign up for, for traceoriginal.com. And then I can take any, any data and I can create my document. I can write it from scratch. I can do drag and drop. I can start with a PDF and I can create the trace original document. Once that is done, the document is, is, can be managed and stored and received by anyone free of charge, right? So anyone can receive it, anyone in, in an email, through Swift, in, in any medium, um, you can deal with it and you can handle it. As I, as I, also, as I mentioned, what you need, you need a computer and you need access to the internet. So if you want to update your original document, you need to go to our website to get in contact with the notary service and you change your document and you get it notarized and then you can continue sort of sending it to to someone else or a, a new entity but that there are no strings attached there is no fees there is nothing uh, so i just wanted to make that 100 percent uh, clear one other thing andrea that i just briefly want to mention if you're Please. really keen, if, if you really want to test this and, and sort of you're a bit hesitant uh, around sort of legislation and everything else, the documents are really convenient because you can, you can create your own little club in the document. Uh, so it, through ITFA, there is a very, very nice solution called the electronic payment undertaking with wording everything. Uh, so if you want to, to create sort of a legally valid um, look-alike of a bill of exchange, uh, but you, you do it on the contract law between the parties. Uh, you have all the, all the instructions you need in order to, to get started. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we have a presentation, an insightful presentation at the end of the year 2020 by Joel. And I still thank Joel for, for that. Uh, I think that was a very, it is actually a very interesting instrument for enhancing digitization trade finance indeed. So anybody else would love to make more questions? I mean, we... Yeah, just a very simple question from me again. Uh, how quickly are you able to onboard a new user to issue a digital original? Um, uh... It really depends on how 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 much the the user wants to integrate to their current systems. Um, if if you're um, if you're a user of China systems, for instance, I think it would, you could do it really rapidly. 
um, if you want to, if you have an in-house system, you probably need to need to uh, look at your workflows, etc. But just implementing our solution, you could do that by using um, Amazon Web Services, um, etc. So it's it's not a huge implementation. Um, um, let's say that you have. If I would guess, if no, you... it's a quick implementation. Everything is ready. You just need a node. Uh, you come to us. We set you up. It will take sort of a couple of days, and then you can you can use our graphical user interface, which is really really easy to use and easy to understand. So not very complicated at all. Well, but that... if 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 you're already have sort of a Finastro or a China system customer, you can go to them and they will set you up immediately. Two. Anybody else? Julian, are you there? Yes, I am. That was, I have no, I think we've, we've, we've reached the end of the hour, right? I think that was a yeah. great presentation. Thank you very much. Very insightful. Thank you. Very nice presentation. Thanks, you, Gunnar, and thanks, Lars, for today's meeting. And I think we, we can call the end of the meeting. And thanks, everybody, for, for being here. We'll see you again in two weeks' time on a different time slot. Okay. And uh, with more insights into this. So have a very nice day, you, you all. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Julian. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. bye, bye. bye, bye. bye Joel. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 bye.